Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. Will a new international bank challenge American global financial hegemony? Well, at recent meetings in Brazil, the five BRICS countries, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, have created a new international bank called the NDB, or New Development Bank, and it's been given $50 billion in initial capital. The BRICS bank works on an equal share voting basis, with each of the five signatories contributing $10 billion. The capital base is used to finance infrastructure and, quote, sustainable development projects in BRICS countries initially, but other low- and middle-income countries will be able to buy in and apply for funding. BRICS countries have also created a $100 billion Contingency Reserve Arrangement, CRA, meant to provide additional liquidity protection to member countries during balance of payments problems and other financial shocks. The CRA, unlike the pool of contributed capital to the BRICS bank, which is equally shared, is being funded 41% by China, 18% by Brazil, India, and Russia, and 5% from South Africa. The new bank is being described as a challenge to the IMF and the World Bank. That is, a challenge to American global financial power. But is it, as Vijay Prashad wrote, neoliberalism with Southern characteristics? Now joining us to discuss all of this, first of all, in Toronto, is Dr. Leo Panich. He's a Canada Reserve Chair in Comparative Political Economy and a Distinguished Research Professor of Political Science at York University. He's the author of The Making of Global Capitalism, The Political Economy of American Empire. And also joining us is Michael Hudson. Michael, are you in New York? Yes, I am. You're in New York. Michael, joining us from New York is a Distinguished Research Professor of Economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Newest book is two newest books, The Bubble and Beyond and Finance, Capitalism and Its Discontents. Thank you both for joining us. Glad to be here, Paul. So, Michael, kick us off. Uh, how significant a development is this? I think it's much more significant than any of the press uh, has said. The press uh, treats it almost as if, well, they're very small and what do these countries have to do? Uh, think of the BRICS as doing on a government level what Occupy Wall Street has been uh, advocating. Uh, when they say a new development bank, they don't mean uh, they want to be like the World Bank or the IMF. They want a different kind of development. But also, it's not only a development bank, but it's the $100 billion currency scheme. They're trying to, uh, they've been driven into a mutual economic defense alliance by the U.S. sanctions against Russia, by the threats against China, uh, not letting it invest uh, in the U.S. on national security grounds. Uh, they've, they've forced other countries uh, really into uh, let us do whatever we want with you. There's no alternative. And we're going to do to you what we did to Ireland and Greece. Uh, and uh, that's it. Well, basically, what uh, the BRICS are saying in their new bank, in their clearinghouse, is yes, there is an alternative. We don't have to be like ne neoliberalism. Their uh, critique of the uh, World Bank and the IMF isn't that they're not given a big enough quotas. It's they disagree with the whole philosophy of the World Bank and the IMF that is subsidizing economic dependency, uh, food dependency, uh, and uh, basically anti-labor parties that uh, result in uh, budget deficits that uh, then uh, governments are told, well, in order to finance uh, your foreign debt and your budget deficit, you have to sell off uh, your water, your natural resources, your privatization. The BRICS banks are not going to go to the member countries and saying, you have to sell off your uh, water supply right. and raise prices right. in order to pay okay, us. Let me bring Leo in here. So, Leo, uh, what do you make of Michael's take? How significant is all this? Well, I think it's very significant, and it is designed to give uh, these large developing capitalist countries more room for maneuver vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the American state and the European Central Bank and the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, but I think the significance he's attaching to it uh, is, is uh, remarkably overblown. Uh, uh, there's no uh, evidence uh, that uh, their purposes uh, are indeed not to apply conditionality to loans. Uh, there's loads of evidence uh, with the non-operation ability of the Bank of the South, which was the bank created in Latin America, that the Brazilians, which have made it non-operational by insisting it be a very conventional development bank, which in fact goes to the markets and therefore is 
constrained by the markets in terms of interest rates to be charged, et cetera, conditionalities, as opposed to Bolivia and Venezuela that wanted it to be, operate on uh, very different non-market principles. The Brazilians uh, don't want that and don't want it for the uh, new bank. And I, I don't think it's just a matter of the Brazilians. The Chinese don't want it either. Uh, I, there's a much deeper factor why it's not so significant, although it does give them some room for maneuver uh, in, in their operations. But the main reason is uh, that uh, they it's embedded in countries, even with China, that don't have uh, the very, 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 as Michael knows very well, deep financial markets uh, that are that is needed. Okay, hang on, this hang kind on, of Leo, bank to play Leo, that kind of role. Leo, yeah. hang on one sec. That's sort of a second point. Let, let, let Michael respond yeah, to your first point. Constraint. Your first point is that this is not something against the neoliberal strategy. This is some independent maneuver of countries that do work within a neoliberal strategy. So well, what do let you me make just of that? emphasize that look who has just elected the as the government of India. Uh, look at the extent to which even the Workers' Party has been uh, keen to integrate further into global capitalism. Uh, let's look at the way in which China has just begun to remove some of its financial restrictions. Uh, and let's look at what the ANC now represents. So sure, they want more room for maneuver, but within the framework of buying into capitalist globalization uh, and Michael, being extremely dependent on it. Okay, Michael, you can respond. Uh, neoliberalism is not simply an economic philosophy. It's uh, interwoven with American foreign policy. Uh, take the case of Ireland uh, when it bailed out the banks a few uh, years ago. Uh, it, uh, Europe uh, was coming to an agreement and the IMF with Ireland uh, to write down uh, the debts until uh, Tim Geithner called from the Treasury and said, wait a minute, you can't write down the debts because American banks have written credit default insurance and the American banks will take a bath because we've bet uh, uh, that Ireland will pay, so don't bail it out. So Europe and uh, uh, Ireland both uh, surrendered and said, okay, we're going to follow you. Same thing in Greece. Uh, uh, the IMF even got into an argument with the EU saying you can't be uh, that bad against Greece. You can't really force it into so deep a recession. Uh, the U.S. got on the phone and said, wait a minute, the Greek, the American banks have written default insurance. Uh, you can't write it down. If you do, uh, uh, we're all going to have to pay through the nose and we're not going to take uh, uh, take a loss. So at issue isn't bank profits or capitalism. It's specifically the United States. And it's the United States that has the veto on the IMF the United States that has the veto in the World Bank. Uh, and basically, I think the what's motivated the BRICS, these countries together, is they have one thing in common. They're all under attack by the United States, economically, and in Russia's case, militarily, uh, with sanctions. And so what Russia is trying to do is say, look, right now, uh, the United States can make a threat against this. They can say, if you don't do what we want, militarily, or politically, or economically, we can block uh, your, your currency payments. We can block the banks and we can strangle you. So what Putin in his press conference for the BRICS said was uh, the distinguishing feature is we're, we're not putting in dollars into these banks. We're putting in our own currencies and the loans will be made in our own currencies. And the fact is that governments can create as much of their own currency as they want. They don't have to go to the market. In principle, now uh, uh, what Leo says is absolutely true. If uh, the hard, if Brazil, which is still run pretty much by the banks, insist in having the banks go to the market, then it will be uh, tied in enough. But if uh, the uh, if Russia, China, and the other countries use modern monetary theory and say, okay, our treasuries are going to print uh, the money uh, to develop, and we don't need. Uh, uh, Wall Street, then uh, you'll have a complete... Yeah, let, okay, let Leo jump in. Leo, well, go ahead. Michael, if you were advising them, they might, although there would be very, very heavy, as you would admit, sacrifices that they then would have to bear. Uh, but these are states that reflect their class structures. These are states that, like the United States, uh, reflect powerful forces within it. And uh, what you're proposing is not something that any of the dominant capitalists in any of these countries, whether you know uh, foreign mining companies in South Africa or ambitious Chinese multinationals, want to happen. Moreover, uh, the the notion 
that they're not interested in convertibility into American dollars, I mean those particular domestic capitalists in those countries, uh, is absurd. No. So, sure, Putin, Putin can spout off all he wants about the ludicrous notion of the ruble as a international reserve currency with none of the infrastructural capacity to make it such. But this is not a practical uh, alternative. That's, That's not to say it isn't designed to do, as you say, to give yeah. them some it, both rhetorical and maybe in, institutional room for maneuver. But it, let's not overblow this, for heaven's it, sake. Okay, it's not made. Uh, there is no attempt uh, by Russia to make the ruble a convertible currency. What Russia wants to do is to nominate its trade in rubles, just as China's denominating its trade in yen, so that the United States cannot use its banks to do what they've done in the case of Argentina and say, uh, we can block any payment going through the banking system, just like after the Shah was overthrown in Iran, uh, 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 Iran tried to pay its foreign debts, uh, uh, the new regime, and uh, Chase Manhattan acted on behalf of the U.S. government and blocked Iran's payment, forcing it into default. Uh, uh, causing a crisis. Now, Iran is a uh, observer member of the Shanghai Cooperation uh, uh, Organization that's part of uh, the BRICS, uh, and uh, the whole attempt is to make an alternative. It's to avoid the dollar. It's not to make the ruble an international currency. It's to get free of the dollar and hence free of the kind of sanctions that uh, uh, the United States has just escalated against Russia today free of the monetary sanctions and free of the ability of the U.S. to use the dollarized system as yeah, a political I, I, coercion. I know that's their objective. I, I don't disagree with you that that's their objective. I think if we're assessing the significance of this, I think we have to success, assess the likelihood of this. We have to assess what uh, the most powerful forces inside their own countries want in this respect, how many eggs they're going to put in this basket. What is the capacity of these countries to operate outside of international financial markets in which the dollar, but by which we really mean very powerful financial institu institutions headquartered in the West with the states that represent them? You're right. Uh, continuing to exist. Okay. This is the dialectic at work, and it's the dialectic between national interest and the interest and the vested interests within the country. You're seeing that in the United States right now over the Argentine. Uh, crisis, uh, where the banks uh, and the Treasury Department uh, and the White House all uh, wanted the Supreme Court to overrule uh, Greece's ruling about the debt defaults. Uh, and uh, you're, you're, these, these class interests are themselves in conflict, and very often, uh, just as American foreign policy has been captured by the neoliberals uh, and neocons, uh, th this can hurt many of the most vested interests here. Same thing in Russia and China. So uh, it's it's a whole dialectic. Of Mike, Michael, to... Michael, I want to just just refocus this because the, the the first part of the argument was whether the strategic objective of this bank is actually anti neoliberal. Because it seems to me there's two different issues here. If they want to have more room for their own sovereign interests within this whole neoliberal financial system. That's one thing. It's another thing to say that they want that, plus they want that to avoid things like structural readjustments and all the various privatizations and attack on social security net and lowering wages. I mean, it seemed to me at the beginning you were suggesting they want to go against those kinds of policies. And Leo yes. asked or said there's no evidence of that. So what's the evidence well, that, of that? If you, uh, if you read Putin's press conferences uh, that he's given explaining his aims, and they're available on Johnson's Russia list uh, that has uh, both his and Lavrov's, uh, the foreign uh, minister's uh, comments, you see that they've spelled this out exactly, that the neoliberalism is uh, not only privatization, but it's the idea, uh, what's really at issue is our economy is going to be planned uh, by Wall Street and financial interests, or are they going to be pl uh, planned by governments? Uh, Come on. With a view towards raising a, a Michael, living no, standard. Michael, no country has privatized more. No ruling class has privatized more than the oligarchy around Putin. They've taken that country's wealth and put it in their back pockets. And even if it is officially still owned by the states, it's in their back pockets. Let's not turn 
Putin right. and his cronies into the vanguard of a new socialist society, for heaven's sake. I cannot argue with that, Leo. You're absolutely right. Uh, it's so very important we not do this. The question is, what what's the evidence uh, that there is a break from neo neoliberalism? I mean, another break that uh, they've all said is, well, neoliberalism really means uh, the dollar standard. And uh, it means uh, lending money in dollars for imports. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the things that uh, the BRICS conference said was, we will be lending money in domestic currency. Now, that's very important because the World Bank doesn't lend money in domestic currency. That means it doesn't lend money for land reform, for agriculture, for all of the expenses that are met domestically uh, for labor, uh, to develop agriculture, to develop uh, industry. It, it only lends dollars basically to buy U.S. Uh, exports of infrastructure, U.S. engineering exports and European. Uh, so making loans in domestic currencies for domestic de development, uh, for instance, China, uh, would love to see uh, Latin America, instead of producing uh, hard cash plantation crops, it would love to see it produce uh, wheat and food. This would have a byproduct. It could feed itself, as Argentina is now doing, and it could export. So a shift of what it's financing to wheat away from other things would be a, a big change. Again, I don't know what evidence you have that China has not played an enormously massive role in producing export-oriented monocultures yes. in, 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 in South America. In yep. fact, uh, uh, you know, the Landless People's Movement, uh, whose main theme is that, you know, we have such a massive population, we need a diversified agriculture uh, to feed it. It doesn't target any longer the United States as imposing that upon Brazil, for heaven's sake. Brazil, yeah. sure, is looking for room for maneuver in terms of diversifying its exports by concentrating on monocultures, as is Argentina with soy, to be sent to China. I mean, I don't think that one should look at these ruling classes in the global south with rose-colored glasses, even though we want to be able to recognize the extent to which the American state is indeed the imperial state governing, superintending this global capitalism. And we need to, of course, be critical of it. But that is doesn't mean we need to be naive about what these other states are. No, what I said is that the exports that China is uh, uh, trying to uh, develop, and you're absolutely right, it, of course it's, it's uh, promoting exports to itself, are different from the kind of development exports the United States wants. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're, uh, economies are so asymmetrical. The United States doesn't want uh, food exports because uh, it wants the world to become dependent on American grain and American agriculture. That's been the basis of American foreign policy since World War II. So uh, just shifting to grain and to, to food grains as opposed to uh, other cash crops uh, is something that at least uh, in an emergency, the countries will be able to feed uh, themselves, which they're not able to do under the current uh, system. Okay, Leo, let's dig in a little further just how significant this. Now, the size of the economies we're talking about are massive. Uh, the, my understanding is south-to-south -south trade is now larger than north-to-south trade by over $2 trillion, and that's about a quarter of global trade. So the, is, is the potential here... Of, of them, of these countries seeking to build some kind of a more independent financial structure, sig significant. I mean, you said earlier there's a deeper issue here, and I kind of cut you off. What's the what's the deeper significance here? Well, obviously, uh, these are very important developing capitalist countries. Unfortunately, they're developing capitalist countries rather than developing socialist countries. Uh, that's what's happened, even with the Workers' Party in Brazil and the ANC and the South African Communist Party. Uh, all the more so will it now happen with a right-wing-led India, uh, and it's happening with a vengeance with a communist party that is very venally uh, turning its elite into a capitalist class. So it, it, it's a developing capitalist country. That's significant historically. Uh, it certainly undermines the old notion that uh, capitalism was underdeveloping the global south, that people used to blame the United States for that. Uh, we now see that there's a rapid development, which the United States has encouraged through free trade and neoliberalism, uh, very much so. 
That said, it'll be much more difficult to integrate those countries within the American empire than it was to integrate uh, the former imperial countries of Europe and, and Japan uh, for reasons that have to do with the lack of military occupation, uh, that have to do with differences in religion, culture, history, language, etc. That's certainly true. Uh, and it's significant. But the, the important thing that's going on now that's much, much more significant is the participation of these countries in guaranteeing in the wake of this crisis through the G20 and through their very active cooperation in this that the crisis would not lead to the reimposition of tariff protections. It would not lead to the imposition of an, an extension of capital controls. All of the things that occurred during the Depression in the 1930s, when there was a breakdown of capitalist globalization, these countries are opposed to this. Now, insofar as we might see a break from Russia under pressure from the United States, that would take much more the form of a right-wing nationalism uh, led by this Russian oligarchy than it would be uh, something progressive, unfortunately, given the balance of forces in Russia. But I think the, main, the main thing is that these countries are not getting off the, globalized, the capitalist globalization bandwagon. They're looking for more room for maneuver within it. Okay, so uh, Mike, Mike, Michael, I, if I understand your main argument is, and it's, in some ways it's not that different on, in some respect from what Leo's saying. You're not saying they're getting off the whole capitalist bandwagon. What you're saying they're doing is buying themselves a little more room in terms of their foreign policy. There's a very broad range over what they can do. And at the very, if you look at what is the most likely common denominator, it's exactly what Leo said. The common denominator is it's their capitalists against the U.S. capitalists. It's their saying, what can we do to be free of the uh, U.S. banks uh, and, and Wall Street and uh, the city of, England, of London uh, and uh, the financial extractive loans? At least uh, the the uh, neoliberal plans today have gone beyond trying to finance infrastructure development. It's they, uh, the financial system in the West is almost entirely extractive now, not productive. The uh, capitalist class in the countries that Leo's mentioned uh, want at least some bank to do some uh, uh, productive uh, loans that, will, uh, that they can benefit from, rather than having the U.S. come in and grab everything for itself, like a private, uh, privatization on behalf of uh, the U.S. You see this kind of fight going on in Greece right now, where uh, Euro the Eurozone said Greece has to privatize uh, its uh, natural resources to pay the debt. Half the privatization last year was to be the sale of its gas rights. And you know well, who's buying? Gazprom was you know who's better, getting... and Europe said, never mind, uh, don't sell them, we don't want Russia. Only, only us, not Russia. But you know who's buying the port of Piraeus? The Chinese. Uh, one of the largest and more China. China. Chinese right. capitals. So I'm sorry, I don't see the world as in, in terms of competition uh, amongst the capitalist classes of the world in the sense you're speaking of. I think there is a very deep integration uh, on the part of the leading capitalists in these countries, including the domestic ones into globalization. I think that's true of Vale in, in, in Brazil. Uh, that's the, the, big, that's the world's largest iron ore company. That's the world's largest iron ore company, which sure is, is competing with other iron ore companies, uh, but it doesn't see itself as aligned against the American bourgeoisie uh, or the American capitalist class. This, this is not right. And moreover, I think that these capitalist classes very much want access to the deep financial markets of London and New York. They don't want to leave them. They want to be part of them. They want access to them. Indeed, they've been floating bonds in those markets, uh, dangerously in terms of volatility. So I, I, I think, when, and, and it has to be said, the reason they do so is that their uh, financial markets, their bond markets, even the European bond market relative to the London, New York uh, access remain extremely weak, extremely vulnerable. So it's also a matter of where the deep institutional strength of capitalism is. Uh, I would make one other point. I don't think that finance, even Wall Street and London, City of London finance, is merely parasitic. Uh, I think it facilitates it underwrites, 
Uh, it's very important in terms of hedging for all of the integrated production that goes on between China and the United States, between South Africa and Europe. Uh, this plays a functional role for all these uh, value chains. Of course, there's loads of speculation in this, but it means that industry is linked up with this speculation. These aren't separated compartments, and, and you, you can't unscramble them. I see that I'm emphasizing the geopolitical much more than you. Uh, nobody's talking about uh, these uh, Brazil and other countries not interacting with uh, the London and New York money markets. What they don't want to do is to have the U.S. Uh, government and U.S. banks uh, uh, act as a threat, uh, a threat against their countries. Sure, uh, sure. And of course, they're trying to uh, keep their uh, have other options apart from being tied into the U.S. Uh, as a system of control. They want to break free of U.S. control, basically, and uh, European yeah. control is a satellite of the United States. Yeah, okay. but since politics and economics aren't so easily separated, their, increased in, their, their continuing interest and increased interest in being linked economically and financially means that the American state, given its superintending role of Wall Street and, and the city of London, uh, will continue to have power vis-a-vis -vis them. They would like to, uh, as we've agreed, they'd like to have more room for maneuver in the face of that enormous power of the American empire. But they are not interested in breaking from it. Okay, guys, this is a, a, a wonderful beginning to a very complicated subject, and we are going to pick this up again. Uh, so I'd like to just say to our viewers, um, if you have questions you'd like me to ask, because I will ask both the gentlemen to come back and carry on this discussion, uh, you know, below the video, make your comment, or you can just write to uh, contact at therealnews.com, or you can go at The Real News on Twitter. Uh, send, send in your questions and comments, and uh, we will pose them to, to our guests. Uh, Leo, Michael, thank you very much for joining us. Glad to be here, Paul. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.